to Regaining the Balance. I, my name is Matt, and today we are going to be going over um, what uh, a little bar, part of uh, Anatolia Fomenko's book, um, History, Fiction, or Science, in his very first book, or his second book here. And it's in the first chapter. We're going to be going over what he calls biographical parallelism between the Second and Third Roman Empires, the 330 year shift. And the reason I wanted to do this video is to um, give you guys a really good understanding of how history can be stacked on top of itself by just changing names and all these other things. And uh, by extending a history timeline, uh, by doubling um, whatever true story there was and creating fake stories. And the funny, the, the hard part for us is figuring out which one is true and which one is completely made up. And that's a tough one because... Um, the reality is, is that there are there are almost the the ancient let's say ancient uh, books really are only available in copies, and um, and this happened not that long ago. So we don't really have a ton of information from ancient sources other than copies from uh, the ecclesiastical community, so to speak. Anyways, let's get into it. So biographical parallelism. This is going to be interesting. Alongside the statistical superimposition, there are amazing biographical parallels which all but identify the map codes of these two dynasties as one another. We feel obliged to reiterate that the detection of a separate isolated pair of, quote, similar biographies, unquote, certainly does not mean anything. However, the occurrence of two long sequences of such biographies spanning a total of several hundred years gives one plenty of food for thought. The biographical parallelism that we have discovered over the proximity of the relevant map codes, see Cron 1, Chapter 5, impelled us to compile a number of rather extensive tables and to compare them to each other. In order to save space, we shall only list the focal points of the multi-centenarian parallelism. Naturally, the royal biographies that we have compared were written by different scribes. These scribes would sometimes contradict each other and their evaluation of a given ruler's endeavors to a great extent. One scribe would praise an emperor while another would pour scorn over a said figure. However, the most remarkable fact is this long chain of coincidences is that all of them were discovered as a result of a continuous formal comparison of kings that possessed identical numbers to their dynasties over the length of nearly 300 years. The parallelism between the Second and Third Roman Empires begins with prominent political figures. They both bear the name of Lucius, as well as similar, almost identical, honorable titles, not applied to anyone else in these empires. Restitutor Urbis and Restitutor Orbis. The parallelism ends with prominent political figures that accomplish fairly similar deeds, for instance, both of them had granted civil rights to entire free populace. Superimposition transforms empires and periods to, of joint rule into near clones. Official collective joint rules like triumvirates are identified as similar joint rules such as tetrarchies. Tetra tetra <laughs> the biographical parallelism, which often surprises us by the amazing uniformity of, quote, conspiracy backbones, unquote, lasted for nearly 300 years. The letter A stands for the Second Empire, and the letter B for the Third. So, let us begin. It starts with Lucius Sulla, and then we have Lucius Aurelian. The Second Empire, the official title of Sulla, Restitutor Urbis, Urbis or the Restitor, Rest, Restorer of the City, this title was given to no one else in the Second Empire, first name, Lucius. But in the Third Empire, the official title of Aurelian, Restitutor Orbis, or the Restorer of the World, the State. This title was given to no one else in the Third Empire, first name Lucius. The name coincides. Second Empire, Sulla is Roman Emperor, emperor according to Plutarch, for instance. In this Caligarian history, Sulla is not formally considered an emperor. This, however, does not conform to direct references of the, quote, ancient, unquote, authors who distinctly refer to Sulla by his emperor's title in Plutarch's, in Plutarch's work. Modern historians believe the emperor's title to have had a different meaning when applied to Sulla, Third Empire, Aurelian, a Roman, Empire according, a Roman emperor according to the Scaligarian history. 
Second Empire. Sulla becomes an emperor as a result of a civil war. Being the most successful military leader, it was one of the bloodiest wars ever seen by the Second Empire. It had raged for many years. Third Empire. Aurelian seizes power as a result of a war against the Goths. Being the most capable military leader, the war with the Goths is one of the bloodiest wars seen by the Third Empire. It also lasted for many years. Second Empire. The war, the war is predominantly civil and external to a lesser degree. The troops crown Sulla emperor. The Senate pronounces Sulla the dictator. And here we are on figure 1.4. Third Empire, the war is both civil and external. It completes a major civil war in Italy that dates to the middle of the alleged 3rd century AD. The troops pronounce Aurelian the emperor. The Roman Senate approves the election of Aurelian under the pressure of the troops. 1.5. A. Second Empire, Sulla actually establishes the Second Roman Empire after a period of anarchy and republican rule. He is thus the first emperor regent for four years, 83 to 78 BC, or 82 to 78 BC. The beginning of Sulla's reign is dated back to either 83 BC or 82 BC, the year of his victory at the walls of Rome. The Third Empire, Aurelian, restores the Roman Empire after a severe period of strife. He is the first emperor of the Third Empire. He rules for five years, 270 to 275 AD. And the two reigns, the two reign durations are of virtual similar length. And then 2A, we have a period of strife. And then 2B, we have a period of strife. The Second Empire, after the death of Sulla, the civil war flares up again, actually takes a series of wars fought by Pompey, Etal, two brilliant military leaders gain prominence, Junius Brutus and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. The troops of both leaders are defeated. In 2.1b, the Third Empire, after the death of Aurelian, the stability of the state is lost again and mutiny begins. Tacitus, the successor of Aurelian, is murdered. The two new emperors again gain prominence, Florian and Probus. The troops of one of the military leaders, Florian, are defeated. Second Empire, the strife lasts for approximately one year, 78 to 77. Third Empire, the strife lasts for approximately one year, 275 to 276. The lengths obviously coincide, as we can read. And then, uh, let's see here, we'll skip that one. The Second Empire after the 3.1a, the Second Empire after the death of Sulla and a brief period of strife, Marius Quintus Sertorius, the emperor of the troops, comes to power. However, he gets murdered as a result of a plot. Third Empire, after the death of Aurelian and a period of anarchy, Probus becomes emperor. Soldiers riot against Probus and murder him. Sertorius rules for six years. Probus rules for six years. Period of strife, yet again, for both. Second Empire, after the death of Sertorius in 71-72 BC, a great embroilment begins, marked by a uprising of Spartacus in particular over the course of these two years. Two mil- military leaders attain prominence, Pompey and Crassus. The two are the most brilliant warlords of those years. Third Empire, the death of Probus in 282-284 to AD was followed by a violent civil unrest. In the course of these two years, two military leaders managed to distinguish themselves, Aurelius Carinus and Numerian, the two are the most eminent public figures of the period who are identified as the duplicates of Pompey and Crassus. Here we go. Strife lasts for two years. The strife again lasts for two years for both times. And uh, um, Gaius Pompey Magnus, the organi- organizer of the first triumvirate. Diocletian the Divine, the organizer of the first tetrarchy. Excuse me. Second Empire after the strife of 70 BC, the power passes into the hands of the Emperor Pompey the same year. He enjoys a splendorous triumph and becomes honored with the consul's title. The period of Pompey's reign is known as the Epoch of Pompey's Principate. For Pompey, the situation with his imperial title is similar to Sulla's, although contemporary historians do not consider Pompey to have been, quote, an actual emperor, unquote. Plutarch uses the title to refer to him without any hesitation whatsoever. There are also numerous ancient inscriptions in existence that call Pompey emperor without any doubt, double talk at all. The Third Empire, after the strife of 284, so the Third Empire now, with after the strife of 284 AD, Diocletian is crowned emperor. With Diocletian coming to power, quote, a new epoch begins in the history of the Roman Empire, the epoch of Dominate. Second Empire. 5.2a, 
Pompey is one of the most famous rulers in the history of Rome. He accomplishes large-scale democratic reforms, in particular the reformation of the court and the troops. Pompey was declared divine in his lifetime. Third Empire. Diocletian is one of the most eminent rulers in Roman history and initiator of several important democratic reforms. He reforms the court as well as military bodies. He is also the author of the monetary reform. Diocletian was also deified in his lifetime. Second Empire, in alleged year 49 BC, the Roman Senate strips Pompey of all his powers. This marks the end of Pompey's reign. He dies in several years. Third Empire, in the alleged year 305 AD, Diocletian abdicates, which marks the end of his reign. He dies a few years after that. Pompey ruled over it for 21 years. Third Empire, Diocletian ruled for 21 years. Again, the reign coincides. And it just goes on and on and on for pages like this. I mean, look at, if, you know, if you're watching this right now, and then finally he gets into uh, the superimposition of the Israelite Theomachist kingdom over the Third Roman Empire in the West. That should be interesting. But I'm not going to read this whole book to you guys. I think you guys should definitely check this out. And just for your own sake, take a look at how many of these uh, just, there's, it's identical. There's so many absolutely close things here. And this is, this is the crux. This is what we're going to be doing here. This is the, one of those things that we are going to be wanting to look through because it's going to be an important, it'll be very important for us. Um, to understand what we're looking at. And, uh, and as you can see here, so we read all that, and this is the kind of graph that he creates statistically. Now, um, I, well, I'm going to leave, uh, you know, again, I'm going to leave some videos, uh, the Russian documentaries. It sort of explains Fomenko, his methods, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm, there's just too much of it to go through here. But uh, if you haven't, if you're not, you know, um, familiar with it, you should definitely check it out because uh, there's some very interesting stuff here. But at the very least, you'll understand that he doesn't just come to these num to these kind of things erroneously. And the statistical mathematical method that he created is, I mean, you know, it's not perfect because you're, we're working with imperfect documents and imperfect history. But he does an amazing job at using mathematics to separate everything I just read to you. And then as you can see here on this page, here we have these two different Roman periods. And even though there are differences in it, there are so many things that are exactly, that are, are just too, they're like, they're ghosts. And so it'll be our job to sort of pick through this. I'm not ever going to say that I'm 100% right about everything because I have no idea. But... Throughout the many years of research I've done, um, which for me started on a spiritual basis and then went into history afterwards, uh, you know, I have a, so much to show you guys. And I do speak French and read it, and my wife also his native French. And uh, we, we have translated um, a number of different documents or are in the middle of translating even more. Um, that's going to show you not just the big holes in the chronology, uh, number one, but number two, um, a lot of just uh, this glossing over of history. And, um, you know, there will be a lot of things that you guys will see that will be surprising in the future. And um, some of you will be amazed by it. Some of you may be offended by it. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm just searching. And whatever I find is whatever I find, and I'm going to share it with you guys. And you can tell me what you think in the comment section or whatever else. But um, I think uh, this video, I'm going to wrap it up um, just so you guys understand how absolutely similar so much of this really is. I mean, this is just, it's really crazy. It's really insane. We're going to look at religions in history and how religions in themselves are also part of the reason why the, you know it actually steered um, these various civilizations throughout time and um, and became the basis of their civilization, of their beliefs, belief system and, when, and what have you. So um, 
either way, um, I hope you guys enjoy this little tiny taste of, of flamenco, some of flamenco's work, and I think it's very important that we certainly look at these uh, these type of ghost type of uh, empires seriously, because it's going to help us piece together the truth as much as we can. So, uh, thank you again for joining me. Please like if you like the hit the like button if you enjoy this video, and share if you think other people would be interested in this, and um, and subscribe. And uh, tell your friends about it. Because there's going to be some really crazy stuff that I'm going to be bringing you guys in the next couple of months. And then maybe, or maybe many years to come. <laughs> so uh, thank, you for, thank you so much again for joining me. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.